Well, good morning, church. As always and every time, it's my pleasure to be leading you in worship this morning online. I just wanted to take a moment today and say thank you. You know, as we look forward to what might change and what might look different about Redeemer's worship online, I just wanted to appreciate all of you who, for however many weeks it's been, you've been so attentive, you've been so engaged, you've been so uh, patient and merciful and generous and all of the things that you have been to us as church leadership and to each other in this difficult time where we are communicating and connecting with you online and engaging in this way. It It's only worked because of you guys. And so I just wanted to appreciate you for that and give you that credit where I think it's due. This morning in worship, um, I want to continue on in that attitude of giving credit where it's due and giving praise. And um, we're going to sing this song about the debt that was lifted from us with the sacrifice that was made on the cross. This is a good old song. It's one of my favorite songs. It's called I Will Sing of My Redeemer.
Good morning, Redeemer. I'm Pastor Jason Deshaun. I want to thank you so much for being with me for worship online at Redeemer. As a church, we'd love the opportunity to bring you new ministry content as soon as it becomes available. So consider clicking the follow or subscribe button and enabling notifications to see what is new from us all the time in real time. Now, in an age when tragedy and discouragement leads the news. It can be a challenge to see God's goodness. However, this challenge is not unique to right now. In fact, from the very beginning of the church, trouble has been distracting us from what is good from God. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Philippi, gives us some clear instructions on how to keep our focus on God. He writes these words, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul tells us to be intentional, to set our minds on the goodness of God that is all around us. Now, I see so much goodness all around us at Redeemer. This past week, my family and I hosted a solo marathon around our neighborhood. It was to build community in our neighborhood, but also to raise money for Feed My Starving Children. I was beyond overwhelmed, if there is such a thing, beyond overwhelmed with your support and generosity. And Redeemer, you you show so much goodness. Redeemer is generous in its goodness. And as a reminder, you can continue to worship in that spirit of generosity. You can give online at the Redeemer website, but you can also send your offering to the church office. Again, I just want to thank you personally, Redeemer. Thank you for all that you do and the generous hearts that you have. I also want to take a moment to to address the biggest question over which we at Redeemer have been praying and discerning. When will Redeemer host on-site services? The date we are gathering is Sunday, July 12th, 9 a.m. in the sanctuary and 10.30 a.m. in the activity center. Redeemer Online Worship will continue to premiere at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday as we host alongside that our services in our facility. Please go to the Redeemer website so that you can be sure to register if you're planning to attend, but also to find out all the steps we're taking at Redeemer to ensure your safety and to provide you with an amazing worship experience. Today's message comes from Redeemer missionary Kent Truel, serving with Youth with a Mission in Australia. We want to just take a moment, and I want to invite you into that moment to pray for him as he brings his second message in his series, Serve and Share. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful. So grateful for you and and all that you do for us. Please open us up to receive what it is that you have for us this morning. For us from, from Kent and his message challenging us to to serve as you command. And so, Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, and make us ready for all that you have in store for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's saints said, wherever they are, amen. 
Hello, Redeemer. It's nice to be with you once again. Happy Father's Day um, for last week. Sorry I ne neglected to mention that. We have Father's Day in September here in Australia, so it didn't actually cross my mind. Anyway, um, I'd like to continue on the series, Serve and Share, Biblical Wisdom Part 2. Uh, in these two weeks, I'm looking at the two things, serve and share. Um, last week, of course, I spoke on the word serve, the upside-down concept of servant leadership, uh, where a servant leader leads a group of people from behind rather than from above or in front. Jesus was very much a revolutionary, a transformative leader. He wasn't a tyrant or a dictator. Rather, he was a servant who raised up other leaders. Jesus facilitated, empowered, and transformed others so that they were the ones who grew and increased in their own capacity to lead a movement, to start the church, to transform lives in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the outermost parts of the earth. Last week, we looked at Isaiah chapter 42 and unpacked just one element of verse 1, which was the phrase, Here is my servant. This week, we will unpack three more elements of verse 1 and also verses 2, 3, and 4 of Isaiah 42. <clears throat> we will, of course, focus on the word share. To share means to mentor and influence the lost in order to be changed by Jesus Christ. So before we go any further, uh, let's bow and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you that we can share this time together, even from all around the globe, even up at the lake in northern Minnesota or southern Minnesota. Um, thank you that you are with us wherever we are, that you are omnipresent, that you are all loving, all powerful, all knowledgeable. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ into the world to reconcile us to you, Father. Thank you that we have relationship with you because of that. And help us to be a part of reconciling the world to Christ, just as Christ did for us. So open our minds, fill us with your Holy Spirit to understand your word, your ways, and your person. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, here we go. Isaiah 42, once again, verses 1 to 4. Let, let me read them. <clears throat> let me read these four verses. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, chapter 42, verse 1a, the first element, was here is my servant. So we unpacked that last week. Uh, so let's move on to uh, 42, verse 1b, which says, Whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, Isaiah 42, or all of Isaiah, was a prophecy spoken 800 years before Christ. This prophecy, however, was fulfilled at the baptism of Jesus when the Father in heaven spoke these words from the clouds directly to Jesus, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, Jesus was someone in whose spirit, <clears throat> servant attitude, total obedience was everything that, caused, that called for the pleasure of the Father. Jesus was 100% human, just like us, yet he elicited the pleasure of the Father in heaven. So we too, as humans, we too can elicit the pleasure of the Father as well. <clears throat> now, verse 42, 1c, I have put my spirit upon him. Well, we know that God dwelt by his spirit perfectly in his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And according to our faith, the Spirit of God is given to us like a gift, and can dwell in us, and does dwell in us, too. God's gifts to us, including the giving of His Spirit, 
depend not on God's willingness or ability to bestow, but are based on our readiness and capacity to receive. Jesus, he readied himself and increased his capacity to receive the fullness of God's Spirit while he was on earth. And we too can do this. Now, chapter 42, verse 1d says, And he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Well, here we learn three key things about share. The three key things are the method of sharing is to proclaim. The message of sharing is justice. The audience for sharing is the lost. So let's look in detail at these three points. <clears throat> the first one, the method of sharing is to proclaim. It comes from that first part of the verse, and he will proclaim. Now, proclaiming is not shouting. We have a wrong idea around the word proclaim. Proclaim, yes, is a verb. It is an action. It is focused, like any action verb, on the how. But the heart of the matter is actually focused on the what. In other words, it's not the how to proclaim. Rather, what to proclaim is the key. Well, the what we proclaim, you could call a proclamation. In fact, we do call it a proclamation. And a proclamation is simply a very important message. For example, here in South Australia, uh, we have Proclamation Day holiday, which is on December 28th, and it celebrates the establishment of the government of South Australia as a British province. Uh, America has a provision called Presidential Proclamations, uh, the most famous one is Proclamation 95, better known as the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that all enslaved people in the states currently engaged in the rebellion against the Union, says, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. So in other words, to proclaim is not mere talk or banter. To proclaim anything has to do with the importance of the proclamation, rather than with the brashness or the loudness of our proclaiming. <clears throat> so, Isaiah 42 verses 2 to 3 says, He will not shout or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Now let's look at this. You know, reeds, they actually look pretty strong on the outside, but we all know that they're hollow on the inside. So a bruised reed is actually very weak and vulnerable, so much so that a mere gust of wind may cause it to fold over and collapse. Well, you know what? All of us are a bit like bruised reeds, aren't we? We have bruises, we have weaknesses, vulnerabilities, that even us, if we get pushed too hard, we too just might collapse. And unsaved people, they have their bruises and weaknesses as well. So even in spite of their bravado, uh, most, you know, unspiritual people feel quite vulnerable having a spiritual conversation with a person like you. Similarly, many former churchgoers, you know, rightly or wrongly, have gotten bruised at some point along the way, and as a result, perhaps their faith has gone cold. Well, when we share with people, and you sense and see these vulnerabilities and bruises, is that suddenly a signal to condemn them for leaving the church? Is that the time to call them a weakling for getting hurt along the way? Or if they share certain views on certain sins, is that an invitation to you to proclaim bad news, like they're going to hell? Well, I don't think so. In spite of Christians often characterized as being judgmental and condemning, according to Scripture, we are supposed to be neither. John 3, 17 says, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Scripture also records that Jesus used the phrase, do not, very, very few times. 
But one notable exception was when he said this, Do not judge, lest you too be judged. The truth is, many non-churchgoers still have a tiny bit of faith smoldering down deep. And this verse clearly tells us, don't snuff it out, right? Rather encourage that f flame, fan it into flame, fan into flame their identity, their personhood, that they are a child of God, and God is a father looking and waiting every day for their return. I love these verses. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. This is, in fact, God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Isaiah 61 is a beautiful verse, chapter, portion of Scripture as well. Just listen as I read it out. <clears throat> First of all, these were the guiding verses for Jesus' ministry, so let it be a guide to us as well. So just listen as I read. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news, not bad news, <laughs> to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. It's beautiful. Well, number two, the message is of justice. The message of sharing is justice. And he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, it says in Isaiah 42. So again, just as a review, key one about share is the method or the how, is to proclaim, right? Key number two about share is the message is justice. Again, the heart of the matter is focused on the what. What to proclaim is the key. Verses 3 and 4 of Isaiah 42 reinforce the importance of the message of justice. It says this, In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or fail or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Today, we know justice is a huge topic and is hotly debated. Well, why is that? Because justice is a moral judgment. Justice is a choice about what should be be. Eating from the tree of good and evil. That was a sin in the Garden of Eden, right? Well, when you look at it, it actually sounds reasonable. <laughs> I mean, doesn't God want us to have knowledge of good and evil? I mean, that's what we teach our children, right? Well, actually, yes, he does. But he wanted to tell us and guide us, show us what is in fact good and evil. Why? Because he, the Almighty God, is all-knowing. He is all-powerful, all-present, and all-loving. He, therefore, is a better judge than we are in deciding what in fact should be. But us, by comparison, we're just, you know, micro-loving, maybe, nano-knowing, pico-present, pico-powerful. <laughs> yeah, micro, nano, pico, they're all um, in tiny, tiny fractions. In other words, we are infinitesimal in our ability to know, to decide and to carry out what should be. That is why God should decide what is good and what is evil. The areas of justice and human values, because they are areas of discussion and importance, 
are actually the pathways to change for the human heart. When we look at justice, we also have to look at truth. Truth equals what is. Truth is the actual, you know, factual reality. It is what it is. That's truth, right? However, when we talk about truth, we get in a, a bind, really. Do you believe in creationism or evolution? Do you believe in Jesus? Yes or no? No? Well, now what? If they say no, you're at an impasse. If somebody disagrees about truth, you end up in a dead-end binary debate of yes or no. What is or what isn't? Debates over truth are either agreements or disagreements. They do not lead to change. Conversations of justice and human values, on the other hand, immediately challenge the human heart because we are laden with emotion, with feeling, with purpose, with hope, with morality. Discussions laden with these elements actually open the door to the human heart and the human spirit. And they also give us the opportunity to describe the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the all-present and all-loving Father in heaven. This is what Jesus did. Most of his stories started like this. The kingdom of God is like. Okay, point number three. The audience for sharing is the lost. Again, a review. Key number one about share is the method, which is to proclaim. Key number two about share is the message, which is justice. Here, key number three about share, the audience. The audience is the lost. The verse says it like this, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Now, the word Gentiles really means the lost. Uh, last week's sermon text from Matthew 12 concluded by saying, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Uh, verse 4 of Isaiah 42, we read it already, he will not falter or fail or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Now, islands were very far away places for the people of Israel. So in their minds, it represented Gentiles or people who did not know God. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 to 8 says, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel, the good news, in advance to Abraham, saying, all nations will be blessed through you. The word there is actually ta ethne, all peoples, all ethnic uh, ethnicities will be blessed through you. Luke 19.10 says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And 1 Timothy 2.4 says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. The Bible is clearly a narrative of love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world. It's also a narrative, however, of salvation for the lost. Continues, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, or shall be saved. So we, as the church, we too are to seek and save the lost. That is our audience. Now, yes, the church universal is the bride of Christ. But the church local doesn't exist to sit around and preen itself, buying dresses and shoes and doing hair and makeup like a modern-day bride. No, the local church, according to Ephesians 4.12, is for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Now, the work of service mentioned here is reaching the audience, that is, those who are lost. Again, verse 4 of Isaiah 42 says, He will not falter or fail or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In, the in his teaching, the islands will put his hope Put their hope, 
Well, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, he did not falter. He did not fail. He did not, you know, become discouraged. Neither should we falter, fail, or give up in discouragement until he has established justice on earth. Brings us right to the Great Commission when we talk about the lost. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Now, I'm part of Serve and Share Global. been a missionary supported by Redeemer for 35 years. Uh, again, last week, I emphasized the importance of servant leadership that facilitates, empowers, and transforms people. And, in short, raises up servant leaders, raise up others to be leaders. Well, going and making disciples is the heart of the matter. <clears throat> it's how we raise up leaders. And too many people disqualify themselves for the task of making disciples. I know there's many reasons, but I would like to point out two uh, key ones. Uh, number one, like Peter, uh, they tell God when they feel like they're being called to go share with somebody, oh, I, depart from me. I'm a sinner. I, you know, I'm not good enough. Wrong answer. Uh, another real common one is people s say they're not leaders. Therefore, how can they raise up other people to be leaders? Well, this too is wrong. This thinking uh, comes from the worldly hierarchy of leadership that we talked about last week. Discipleship, remember, is through servant leadership, leading from behind, encouraging, facilitating, and empowering. Remember that upside-down hierarchy of kingdom leadership has bond servants at the top. A bond servant, remember, is a slave. A slave is a person who does not do their own will. We are slaves to the Father. Remember Peter, a bond servant of Jesus Christ? James, John, they called themselves bond servants. They called themselves servants because, like Christ, they were not doing their will, but doing the will of the Father. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Well, this is a command. <clears throat> and it's a command for everybody, not just cross-cultural missionaries like me. This is a command, or this command, rather, is as relevant in Fridley as it is in, you know, Finland. It's as relevant in Minneapolis as it is in Manaus. This commandment is as relevant in America as Amazonas or Australia. <clears throat> Go therefore and make disciples. Well, Lauren Cunningham famously said, Go means a change of location. But it's not just crossing the seas. A missionary is not someone who crosses the seas. It's someone who sees the cross. But it does require going. Go across the room. Go across the street. Go across the city. Yes, maybe even go across the world. But whatever you do, go to others. The lost will not commit themselves in relationship to us if we do not first go and commit ourselves in relationship to them. Go to the lost. <clears throat> now, we are social beings. God is social. We are social. And I know like attracts like. What I mean by that is after we get saved, we like to hang out with other saved people, right? We're like them. They're like us. And the tendency of a Christian worker, especially from a church setting when you're in your own home, is to commit in relationship to community members only after they come into the church. Well, let's think of Jesus. The primary time and activity of Jesus' ministry was actually not evangelism. Firstly, it was in discipleship of the 12 apostles. Secondly, it was telling stories and teaching the good news to the multitudes. Thirdly, it was the physical healing of many sick. Now, even though miraculous power was displayed, Jesus ministered primarily through meeting human needs, like the teaching, like the physical, like the leadership development among the apostles. And as he was meeting human needs, he proclaimed the good news of the gospel and showed them the gospel of the kingdom. 
Jesus did not invite, this is the quote, Jesus did not invite people to join a project or a program or a church or subscribe to a certain system of thought. He called them into a life-transforming relationship. Jesus simply challenged his disciples with the words, follow me. Ministry to others is calling them into a life-transforming relationship with you. You are capable. You are able. Now, I'd like to tell the story of Josephine <clears throat> as an example to help you, uh, il to help illustrate what it is I'm talking about. So, the river people communities that we lived and worked in, <clears throat> their main human need was in the area of health, and Josephine was a nurse and a midwife. So, but even in spite of that fact, we did pray and ask God, should we work in the area of healthcare? And we did feel, yes, we should. Uh, we felt that was, you know, God's will. So we went about serving in the area of healthcare. Now, first of all, through relationship and actually physically living with them, we lived in the villages for three years on a boat so that we can live with them, live like them, live among them. <clears throat> and the community families actually marveled at how our children, who uh, lived and played with theirs, remained healthy while their own children repeatedly succumbed to sickness. Secondly, when Josephine treated those who came to her for any sort of health need, she insisted on teaching them about health. In fact, she went even further. She trained them in how to treat themselves. Um, so in other words, every health consultation was education, training, or leadership development. Thirdly, before that person being treated left the boat, she always asked to pray for them. And on one occasion, um, during the three years that we lived among them, a person did get miraculously healed. That was amazing. It was only one, though. It doesn't sound like a lot. However, it led to the salvation of one man who, because of that, invited us to work in his community, which led, in turn, to the planting of the first River People Church in the region. Fourthly, after a lot of prayer and consultation, uh, Josephine and I decided to uh, set up a rural health agents training program. Uh, we invited two people from seven different communities, a total of 14. Uh, most actually had a very minimal education. Some were even illiterate. Um, and these 14 had the following job description. Number one, they were to be with Josephine. Uh, they were to be with her in learning and in doing healthcare. Number two, they were to preach and teach healthcare to others or health and well being to others. And number three, they were to cast out sickness through prayer, medicine, or both. Now, if you look at Mark 3, um, verses 13 to 15, this is the very job description given to the apostles. Actually, Jesus said he called 12 to be with him, and it said, be with me, preach the good news, and cast out demons. Those were the three uh, things mentioned in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Well, after two years, uh, 13 of these 14 individuals completed their training and were formally commissioned to the task as rural community health agents. And you know what? Over that two-year period, more than half came to Christ. And that is because we shared the gospel. Uh, that is because that vocational learning, we shared our lives, principally Josephine. This is what I mean by mentoring. So what is your response to all this? Serving, both serving and sharing, happens most effectively through close relationship. In fact, intentional relationship is what I call mentoring. Mentoring involves developing disciples through encouragement and sound instruction based on the Word of God and for the formation of leaders. After three years, our rural health agents did not feel um, fully prepared for the job of head, uh, ahead, but we commissioned them anyway. And you know what? They're serving to this day more than 25 years later. In the same way, the 11 
uh, of the twelve apostles. When Jesus left, they too did not feel ready to take the reins and take over. Jesus modeled, he trained, commissioned, then he left. His mentoring and leadership development method was very intense, but it was short. So whether it be for wisdom or social development, healthcare or church planting, when you mentor people, you call them into a life transforming relationship with you. It's all about sharing your life with others. This exposes them to your character, your integrity, your servant leadership, your compassion, your authority, your obedience, and even your righteous indignation. Sharing your life, in short, exposes them to Jesus. Because Jesus Christ is the real and decisive agent in Christian mentoring. Therefore, or to share, therefore, means to mentor and influence the lost to be changed by Jesus Christ. So what is your response? Let's just take a moment and wait. Ask the Lord to highlight something to you right now, a key point that you can take with you into this week. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the wisdom that we find in your word as modeled and exampled by the person of Jesus Christ as he lived among us. He gave his life to us not only on the cross, but every day. He shared himself. He allowed the apostles and others to see his person, his character, um, his, his understanding of the Father. He shared who the Father was. Um, he opened people's minds to understand uh, the Father and His Kingdom and what it means to be a servant leader and an obedient uh, slave to the Father, but reminding them that the Father is a good Father, all-knowing, all-powerful, um, all-present, and all-loving. And we trust in You, Father, and we ask that You would use us uh, to be agents of change in the lives of the lost. Help us, Father, to proclaim the good news of justice in the earth to the lost, that they might come into relationship, firstly with us and then with you, so that they might um, be reconciled to the Father and walk in his ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. God bless you. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in choices to the ancient seal by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, 